Welcome back to the live morning show sponsored by Don Book Chevrolet. We are honored to have Emily Lemus with us today, Executive Director of My Sister's House. Emily, thank you for joining us. Thank this you morning. so much for having me. Our pleasure. Let's get started. Tell us, if you would please, a broad overview of what My Sister's House is and your place in the Rocky Mount National Educational County community. Okay, sure. So we are the Domestic Violence, Sexual Assault, um, and Human Trafficking Service Provider for National Educational County. We are celebrating our 40th anniversary, so we've been around since 1981. Um, we have offices in Nashville and Tarboro near the county seats, so we can be near the courthouse. Um, and so we've, I think we're pretty well known in the community um, as being a safe place for people to go. Um, even if they're not quite always sure what we do, um, I think that that's a, f a fair statement. We've had a great presence in the community for many years. Congratulations on your 40th anniversary. The three things, really, that's a tremendous testament to the organization yes. that you've been through so much time and been a part of the community for that long. You mentioned three areas, domestic violence, sexual abuse, human trafficking. I don't want to take for granted that our viewers understand exactly what each one of those three situations are. Could you tell us just a little bit about what each one of those constitutes? Sure, sure. And I'd love to address a couple misconceptions, things that Please. we hear in the community. Uh, we do serve men, so we are my sister's house, but we do serve the men in the community. Uh, men can be victims of any of those um, as well. With domestic violence, it's within the family. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a romantic partner. It could be an abusive grandson. It could be um, someone who lives in your home, um, someone that you have kids with, maybe you aren't married with, that kind of thing. Would elder abuse fall Elder into? abuse falls into that yeah. if it's a relative that's doing it, and that's far more common than I think uh, people realize, far more common than I thought it was until I started working with my sister's house. Um, and also if someone has maybe a disability or a limitation and their caregiver is their partner, their romantic okay. partner, then that falls under domestic violence um, as well. We cover sexual assault. We try to work a lot with the community colleges in Wesleyan because that's kind of our target audience for sexual assault. The uh, students on mm -hmm. campus. That age. Uh, 18 to 24 in the United States is the most likely age to be sexually assaulted. So we try to keep a very open line of communication with the three schools that are in this area for that reason. Um, human trafficking... Is, oh, yeah, sorry. Again, is there a difference between sexual abuse and sexual assault? Uh, no, they're just they're the same. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, and then with human trafficking, that's pretty new for us, but the state um, has realized that some things that appear to be domestic violence, some things that appear to be sexual assault, are really a part of a larger scale of human trafficking. And so that's um, more recently the state has asked us to, to add that on and to go to some special trainings and have some, um, some special literature on that because sometimes that sexual assault crisis call is actually a part of a larger um, human trafficking situation. And if I could, would you give us just a little deeper definition of what human trafficking is? Sure. It can look a little different um, depending on the situation. Sometimes it's um, people without uh, full status in the United States, and so they're afraid that if they tell anyone um, that they're working without being paid, moved without being asked, um, doing work that they don't want to do or not being compensated, that they'll they'll call immigration or something. The other thing that can happen too is someone just takes your driver's license and your papers, especially if you're new to the country, you could have all the documentation, but if you don't have access to it, there's still that fear. Um, and then of course, um, someone making you do any kind of work where you're not compensated for it or against your will. Um, and that can be done through fear, that can be done through physical abuse, that can be done through threats to you or your family. Um, so it covers kind of a broad spectrum and I will say it happens a lot more than people realize um, in communities just like ours um, where it just goes unseen and I think it's it's um, getting more attention but I still think it's hard to kind of pinpoint until you uh, get in it and then realize all that's going on. And it, I have asked Emily to come back at a later date because I would very much like to take a deeper dive into this particular area in this yes. particular service that my sister's house provides one last question on that sure this also can happen to young people who leave a family situation run away yes and, and, and are on their own for their very first time who may not have the economic means to support themselves sure. they can fall into that as well too. yes and we've actually had people who didn't have the words but described human trafficking. Um, I took a call a few years ago where a young lady was a housekeeper and they locked her in a room every night mm -hmm. and she wasn't paid but she was sheltered and she was fed. So 
they told her that was her compensation and so she felt like well they feed me and they house me I'm not being paid but I have a place to stay and so when she said she couldn't leave the room was locked every night um, I, yeah so sometimes you have people in those situations that just don't realize it um, based on what they understand if someone says well you can stay at my house if you clean and I'll feed you and that's an even exchange but it's not it's not and I'm not laughing at, at, at the situation I'm just laughing because you're right this occurs much more than people may remember. Yes. We'll talk about that at a later date. Um, domestic violence. We have domestic violence abuse uh, awareness month coming up. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us a little bit about that and what My Sister's House is planning to Sure, that? sure. So October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, pretty big month for us. Um, I'm speaking at several churches, civic groups, uh, things like that. So if anyone's church or civic group is looking for someone to speak in that month, my, me or my staff would love to come and talk about what and we're doing. They can reach out directly out to My Sister's yes. House to do uh -huh. this. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so uh, we do that. Uh, we're having a paint night in Tarboro because we do serve Edgecombe County at the Tarboro Brewery Brewing Company on October 12th. Um, we're going to do an online auction like we did last year, the last week of October, uh, as a fundraiser. But we just um, want to celebrate the 40 years, uh, bring attention to um, who we are, what we do, who we serve, and um, how people can help during that month. I'll show my ignorance if this question is incorrect. Is this also when National Night Out is? It can be, yeah, yes. yes. Um, so that's been, the last two years have been fuzzy on things yeah. um, because of COVID. Um, National Night Out uh, with the law enforcement is usually in August, and then you can do a take the night back. That's normally, yeah. I'm, that, uh, that's, it's that's, okay. That's what I was thinking. It's okay. Yes. We've had those in some years. We've also met at the courthouse some years. Last year with COVID, we did an outdoor candlelight vigil in front of the police station in Rocky Mount to kind of meet between the two counties, um, and we read aloud all the names of victims of domestic violence for that year in North Carolina um, so it was a really powerful um, event last year and so one of those things will likely happen in some shape we're waiting on to see what the governor says what COVID yes. does it's hard to plan right now and that would be event at, events at both the Nash and the Edgecombe County Courthouse uh, we have in the past yeah. uh, last year we did the police station just because it was yeah. yeah right in the middle of everything and of course we work a lot with Rocky Mount um, police the Rocky Mount Police Department so it was a good spot for us to be in symbolically and also between the two counties um, that we serve. Um, COVID has affected all of us, both from a personal standpoint, a business standpoint, a, ch a charitable nonprofit standpoint. Yeah. What has my sister's house seen from, in a very broad sense, sure. from COVID? How has it affected your abilities to provide services to victims in the counties and the city? Well, um, I will say we didn't close. Some agencies closed for a few weeks or a few months. We felt, I met with my staff, and we felt that there was just too much of a need. Um, for example, March 2020, uh, when the stay at home stay-at-home order went into effect within about a week or two our calls for March went up 211 percent from the previous year calls across the the board for crisis calls, crisis calls. Mm -hmm. yeah and then April was 48 percent and then we stayed about 25 percent higher than we normally would be for the rest of last year okay. so we saw big in, um, increase of um, those crisis calls those emergency calls in the middle of the night or during the day where someone just needs help um, our shelter uh, is rather seasonal in the sense that summer is always really full hot weather people fight um, but we're seeing that we're full earlier in the spring and later into the fall um, it's it's just been an overwhelming demand for more than a, a year now so I'll understand if you don't want to answer this question but could you tell us a little bit about the type of calls that you started receiving an increased number of sure. during the COVID situation. Yeah, absolutely. And these still continue. Part of the problem is anytime there's more stress in the home, there's more likely to be domestic violence. Now, it has to already be possible in that home. So it's unlikely that someone who's never had any domestic violence will suddenly do this. But stress increases it. So when you have the kids home unexpectedly from school, I'm a mother of five, it was stressful trying to figure out what to do with everybody. Um, now you have the expense of feeding them all day and also homeschooling them and figuring out the technology and a lot of our clients are in rural areas and so they didn't have access to the internet like they needed and so that's stressful. You had people especially in the service industry that lost their jobs or had a severe reduction in mm -hmm. income. The other thing is you didn't get the break. You didn't get to go to work and be around coworkers or people, your friends 
friends or people you care about. You didn't get to go to church. You didn't get that escape. So you're just all together with all of that stress and worry about money and worry about the future and the kids are at home. And so it just kind of imploded um, where people came to us. I will say the severity, especially in the first few months, was much higher because people just didn't have that eight hour a day break where their partner went to work or they went to work and, and got a break. You also didn't have teachers seeing that a child was different or had markings on them or seemed like they weren't sleeping well. So you didn't have that extra check of society check. We check on each other. We ask how you're doing. We ask what's going on. And we lost that um, for a long time. And some people still haven't gotten that back if they're not back in the office at work. And it was I would imagine, tell me if I'm wrong, that because this situation was thrust upon people with a very short period of time, yeah. really within a couple of weeks things went from being relatively normal to this is the way it's going to be. Yes. There was very little opportunity for people to plan for right. the change. Absolutely. Which added to the stress. Yes. Um, and one thing we didn't expect and saw and we were really happy to see is former clients who had not been with us in six months to a year came back um, for food items, for toiletry items because they had that loss of income. And we were excited they came to us because we want them to versus going back to their batterer because they can't provide for their family or kids. So we had so many more requests for uh, food boxes, toiletry boxes boxes, things like gas cards, diapers, um, those kind of things from people we hadn't worked with in a while, which is always what we want. Please always, you know, know that you can come back. We'll help you guys um, figure things out. But um, that was that was surprising and it really got to a point where we were getting on a low pantry, which almost never happens because <laughs> the community is so good to us as far as donating those canned good items. And it, it was it was pretty desperate there for a while. And let's talk about that for a moment. You, you rely on community and, and individuals in the business communities to support you in your pantry and your items like that. Mm -hmm. Did you see that that support remain constant during the, this COVID situation? So in the beginning, I think people were worried about what was going to happen to them and their family. Um, so not really. The summer's traditionally not a high donor time. People are on vacation and doing things, mm -hmm. and that was different this year. But in the fall and Christmas, everything kind of came back. I think we were put back on people's radar mm -hmm. once they stopped worrying about their immediate, you know, needs um, and everything filled back up. I will say when the, um, when everything first started shutting down in March and April, we had things like daycares come and bring us cases of toilet paper because they had it on a monthly subscription and they knew it was going to come next month but they were closed and didn't need it right now. So we had some folks that definitely um, looked out for us with hand sanitizer, soap, um, toilet paper, things like that. What are the sorts of things that you need on a regular basis to support those type of calls? Um, sure. So, I mean, toiletry items like shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, soap, toothbrushes, those and, kind of things. And both for children and, and for adults. adults. Yes. yes. And male and female. Um, we do yes. serve male clients, but we also have a lot of families with teenage boys. So we um, we can we can use uh, male items as well um, for those teenage boys and also for any men that we serve. And then as far as uh, food, we try to take into account what kind of cooking apparatus our clients have some have microwaves some have stoves some have both some have refrigerators some don't and so we we ask that we evaluate the needs of each client um, before we just we don't have a standard box here you go yes. we evaluate what you need do you need diapers do you need this um, so mac and cheese spaghetti and sauce um, those are kind of things that are always good peanut butter and jelly um, is always a good thing and kids tend to like that but even things like fruit cups, fruit snacks. One thing we almost never get is canned fruit. Uh, we get canned vegetables, which are yeah. great, but canned fruit is really great for a family with kids that they can mm -hmm. give their kids that. Juice boxes, you know, kind of whatever your kids eat, our kids eat too. And so we try to have those things as well. Emily, and, and not to go really far down this path, but I, th I think it's important to for our viewers to know the rapidity and the quickness with that these situations can occur because in normal times, if someone realizes that their family situation is becoming abusive at the moment, the decision can be made very quickly for someone to say, I am going to leave. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, this is not healthy for me, not healthy for my family, mm -hmm. my children, fill in the blank. And that decision to leave can be very quickly and oftentimes they will leave with only the clothes on their back. Absolutely. Which is why what you provide them both from a support standpoint and a physical standpoint here, we can give you 
close. We can give you toilet paper. Absolutely. If you would expand on that just a little sure, bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, if someone calls their crisis line, we do try to set up a safety plan and figure mm -hmm. out a way that you can bring some things that's not always possible, especially when something's immediately volatile yes. right now and you need to go. Um, literally, we've had people come to our shelter without shoes on. Um, they had to leave that fast, or their kids don't because they didn't yes. grab them. Um, that's happened more than once. Uh, second season in Bivenu Plaza is our resale store, and it is open to the public, but it is where our clients shop. So even when it's not open, it's open for our clients. We take them there, and it's a cute little boutique, and people can try yes. on clothes, and there's a lot of dignity in that. Everything's hung and steamed and by size. It's like a store. It doesn't feel like you're digging through a donation bin. It feels like you're in a store shopping for you and your children. So um, we, we take care of that pretty immediately. Which is why for folks who are interested in donating, it's donating across the scope from infants, toddlers, newborns, all the way up to adult, yes. male and female, yes. everything, because this really doesn't have a, uh, it's not gender specific or, it's, or that. It's not, and it's not, it's not limited to any one group of people. Another thing that's really nice is um, kind of business professional clothes. Uh, people need those to wear to court. Um, I've mentioned shoes. Um, shoes are important. you got to have <laughs> shoes on to go to the courthouse. A lot of people don't think about that, so when you show up barefoot, we've got to figure out <laughs> shoes so you can see the judge. Again, I'm not laughing. It's no, I understand. Time. Yeah, but it, it, it happens. It happens. It's, it's why the, it's for the community to think about doing this across the board. Sure. Pets. We allow pets. We're one of the few um, um, domestic violence agencies in the country. 2018, Huffington Post did a study, and we knew there wasn't a lot, but we didn't know a number um, until that study came out, and less than 3% of domestic violence agencies nationwide allow pets, and, and that's, we allow pets. And that's important because if a fa if a, if a if it's a couple with children, and one of the one of the parents is thinking about leaving a situation that's not good for them, taking the children, the pet may need to come along as well. Absolutely, too. and yes. and for a lot of people, that pet's their companion. My mom loves her dog. She's going to be with her dog. Um, and the other aspect of it is, if I can't hurt you, I'm going to hurt what you care yes. about. And if that's a dog or a cat, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so we've had that program. Um, it's our Safe Pets program for several years, and it's it's worked out really well. Um, we've had someone drive from Union County to come to our shelter because they got to bring their animal, because wow. everywhere else um, either didn't at all or made you board it somewhere away and you couldn't be with your pets so yes we've sheltered lots of animals sometimes our shelter feels like a zoo a little bit but um, it's a it's a comfort for people um, and a, a one yes. less thing to worry about they're not worried about their animal or feeling guilty about leaving yes. their animal that they can bring that so it's a very important program that we do it is You've got a fundraiser coming up in October. Tell us about that, please. Okay, so we have the paint night on October 2nd. What's that? Um, so we're going to be doing it with Rebecca Watkins Art. Um, she's done a couple of our paint nights, um, and it'll be at Tar River, Tar Burr. Tarboro Brewing Company in Tarboro um, and so it'll be a fall themed um, paint night and so it'll be kind of inside outside because of the space allows it so it's a little um, more friendly for the um, pandemic situation yes. regardless of what changes um, so we have that coming up that we're really looking forward to um, it's always nice to get together in small groups and talk about the agency and answer questions and just spend time together as a community um, and then we have our online auction at the end of October which will be on our Facebook page and that's my sister's house of North Carolina there's more than one so we put the North Carolina <laughs> part in there to make sure you're in the right spot um, and so we're, we're looking forward to those things to bring in uh, some revenue but also awareness to get people asking mm -hmm. questions and thinking about us and what we do for the paint night people will become will be able to come in and paint yeah it's a, a fall it's a fall picture it's got some pumpkins okay. um, it's on our Facebook page um, and there's all the information for signing up on that as well um, and if you need more information we can always uh, call the office as well and so that's two five two four six two zero three um, nine four sorry that's our national office and we can direct you anywhere you need to be and for the auction what type of items are you looking for for the auction? Oh, we have, well, we have quite a bit um, donated. We always have some jewelry. We always have local artists donate things. Um, we have um, art on canvases, but we also have things like decorated birdhouses. Sometimes we have chairs that we auction. Um, we have jewelry. Uh, no, we have a quilt that's made every year um, for the agency for this auction. Okay. So lots of different kinds of things um, from mostly local from the community. Um, I will say a lot even in the pandemic, a lot of the community and a lot of the businesses in the community have really supported us. And so we've all had hard times, but there's still um, 
being very generous with us so we can still maintain some of our events. As our time begins to draw to a close, I just would like to ask, you have the support of the Nash County and the Edgecombe County Sheriff's Department, Absolutely. as well as the Rocky Mountain Police Department. Absolutely. You work very closely with yes. them. Yes. yes. Tell us a little bit about that relationship. Um, it's it's imperative. I, I would say, honestly, we're two sides of a coin. Um, we deal more on the victim side of it and, and, and getting that safety, um, their safety, but on the evidence side and, and getting who the batterer is. And so we need each other. Um, I don't carry a gun. I'm not arresting mm -hmm. anyone. And they're not going to shelter someone tonight. So we need each other. Um, and I think that it works really well. Um, right now, we have a very supportive police department and both sheriff's department um, and both sheriffs are very supportive so when we have an issue or a concern or a safety concern we call each other um, it's not uncommon to see a sheriff's deputy or a police officer in one of our offices figuring things out what's best for our clients so that relationship is is absolutely essential to the work that we do and you have a relationship with the district attorney's office and yes. the courthouses in terms of helping sure the people that you serve if they need to go to court get to court yes absolutely um, we help we assist with transportation even if they're not um, in our shelter we assist with court transportation uh, the clerks help us out quite a bit the judges we've definitely called many of them to come back after they have left for the day because we had an emergency situation yes. and needed a protection order so um, it's it's it takes all of us working together um, and I will say that we all work well together um, and the ADAs and the DA um, when we have questions or concerns when we're trying to find a client when they're trying to find a client because they're trying to go to court and all those things um, I, I think it's we all know each other we all know kind of our place in the in the scope of things and we we help each other a lot um, winding down sure if someone who's listening today believes that they have a need or they know someone that they believe my sister's house could be of service to could provide services to assist them in any of those three areas how can they get in touch with you? Sure. So we have a 24-hour crisis line, and that number is 252-459-3094, and that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Christmas morning, anytime. Someone who's trained, um, staff person or a trained volunteer will be there to answer questions, create a safety plan, um, and help you um, through this process. And we're from start to finish. Yep. And that call is confidential? That call is confidential, um, and you it's anonymous. You don't have to tell us your name. You can just tell us what's going on. Can they access your services online? Not so much because if you need a protection order, you have to go to court for okay. it, but you can access information, what we offer. So we offer transportation, help with uh, legal documentation. We do court accompaniment. We help with um, translations and interpretations when people need that. So, so someone who has English not as their first language, sure. can, you can work with them. Yes, too. we have a full-time Spanish-speaking uh, Latino outreach coordinator, but also there's a large hard of hearing community, and a lot of people don't think of that with the deaf school in Wilson. Those people grow up and they live here. Okay. Um, and so we have a good relationship actually with the school that they'll send over folks, staff and teachers to help um, with the, the hard of hearing and then the state operates a language line and we can cover. We've had, I mean, Vietnamese, um, we've had Polish, we've had Arabic, it, yeah, I mean just right no. here in Nash and Edgecombe County, so. Good to know. Yeah. What's your website? Uh, MSHNC.org. My sister's house, MSHNC.org. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Emily, thank you very much for being with us. And as I said, Emily is going to come back in, in a month or so, and we're going to spend a little more time on the um, human trafficking sure. issue. Not to make, not to put put any less light on domestic violence and sexual right. abuse, but that that holds a special situ, uh, a special place because it's newer to the area, and it's not something that people think about a lot. But it is very, it's prevalent in the yes. area, yes. and I'd like to delve into that. Emily, thank you thank so you much so for being much. with yeah. us. It's a Good pleasure to, to talk to you. Look forward yeah. to talking with you again. And we're going to take our last break now. You are watching the live morning show sponsored by Don Bullock Chevrolet. When we come back, Fred will have our last look at the weather, and Wayne and I will have some closing comments. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back after these messages.